G'day team, Justin Zeltzer here for zstatistics.com and the YouTube channel of the same name or roughly the same name. Uh, I'm here today to do a bit of a new version of a video I did about 10 years ago. Now this video was probably the most popular video I had on my channel for the time and it's stayed that way since. However, because it was done 10 years ago, it kind of sucks, if I'm honest. It's me talking to an Excel spreadsheet, not very good looking, but it was just a good video at the time. So I thought I'd try to do it proud and do a, a new version of that today to make sure it's the perfect video on regression. For those who are new to the topic or those that just want a foundation for it, it's gonna be 40 minutes. Seems like a long time, right? But 40 minutes will get you from zero to hero on the topic of regression. So you don't need to know a thing to come into this video and I guarantee there's gonna be some real nuggets of wisdom that you'll be receiving over the next 40 minutes. So put the kettle on, sit down, and hopefully you'll enjoy what I've got to show uh, for today. So this is the topic list that we'll be looking at in the video. We're gonna start by looking at the objectives behind regression. So giving you an intuition for what regression is all about. And I hope that sets up a nice architecture for you so we can start then looking at the population regression equation and sample regression line. It's at that point that we actually incorporate data to see what can we do with an actual data set to create a regression line and how does that get created. We look at the topics of SST, SSR and SSE, which are the nuts and bolts of the actual mathematics behind creating that regression line. And we talk about the confusion that can occur between the R and the E and how there are some textbooks that actually reverse them. So it does get a little bit tricky, but bear with me and check out that section if you are interested. Uh, we'll then look at R squared, which is a measure of the strength of a regression. And finally, I deal with the pesky topic of adjusted R squared and degrees of freedom which I think I have a quite a unique way of explaining that, which from the previous video seems like a lot of viewers got a lot out of. So stick around, check out that section. It's a 40 minute video, okay? It's gonna take you from zero to hero. I hope you appreciate it. And if you do, please share it. It's taken me a lot to try to put the post-production of this video together. So I hope you appreciate it. And leave a comment, do all those kind of lovely things if you can for the channel. And I'll catch you on the other side. Let's get stuck into it. So let's dive into the objectives of regression. So we can start with a little definition of regression here saying that it's a means of exploring the variation in some quantity. So maybe you're interested in figuring out why heart disease varies or why the interest rates are going up or down. And that variation that they're talking about, the way it moves, we have to separate it. And this is what regression does. It separates that variation into what can be explained and what is unexplained. So there are two components. So let's use the example, and I'm gonna be using this throughout the entire video today. Looking at the ice cream sales of a particular vendor, and we're gonna explain it using three different variables. We're gonna say, let's try to explain why ice cream sales varies using the daily temperature, so that would kind of make sense, right? The higher the temperature of a particular day, the more ice cream sales you'd expect. We're also explaining it by the amount of rain that we have in a particular day. Again, you're expecting that, say, the more rainfall, the less you're going to get for people being out and about buying ice cream. And whether it's school holidays or not, predicting that with school holidays, you're more likely to sell more ice creams, right? These are just predictions so far. But importantly, there's also an unexplained component when we look at regression. There's going to be a part that is left unexplained and regression will be able to quantify how much of that is unexplained versus how much will be explained. How much of the variation of ice cream sales is unexplained versus explained. So that's it. That is the simplest way of thinking about regression. So now we look at how we're going to use algebra effectively to map out this exploration that we're going to do. So let's look at the population regression equation. And you'll see this in any textbook you're given. To simplify things a little bit, let's just look at explaining ice cream sales 
using one explanatory variable, or as we might say, independent variable. We're going to use daily temperature here, forgetting about rainfall and school holidays just for the moment. So here we have our population regression equation. The Y on the left-hand side is called our dependent variable, and that is our ice cream sales. Why is it dependent? Well, the ice cream sales will depend on the daily temperature and not the other way around, right? The daily temperature can be what it wants, and then the ice cream sales will follow. So the daily temperature is our independent variable, that's X here, and the error term relates to everything that's still unexplained. Now these B looking things, well, they're actually Greek letters. They're beta naught and beta one. And these are our coefficients. So these coefficients together with the X term here, as we'll see, it's kind of like a linear relationship with Y. And that's why this is called linear regression. If you remember back to high school and you had Y equals MX plus B, here we have exactly the same thing. Y equals, well, it's not MX, it's beta 1X, and it's not plus B, it's actually plus beta naught, and they've sort of reversed it here, but it's the same thing. It's just a linear relationship that we're modeling between Y, our ice cream sales, and X, our daily temperature. And the one little addition that we have is our error term, which makes it a regression, not just a linear relationship. Okay, so the role of a regression is to both estimate those betas, try to figure out what is that linear relationship? What effect does changing temperature, how does changing X affect Y? Make a change in our ice cream sales. That is the first objective of a regression. We also want to quantify the error. So not only do we want to figure out what is the effect of X on Y, we kind of want to know how much variation is left over. Or as I say here, how much variation in ice cream sales is not yet accounted for by looking at changing temperature. And you'd expect there to be a lot within this bucket of error at the moment. Now, the important thing to understand about the population regression equation, or more specifically about beta naught and beta one, is that these are parameters that we can never ever know for sure. We're only estimating them. Beta one represents the slope of that relationship between y and x. It's the gradient, right? And beta naught represents the y-intercept. Remember that? When x equals zero, y is going to equal beta naught. So we're going to estimate these two parameters, but we can never know what they are for sure. So to actually create estimates of beta naught and beta one, we're going to need some data. And this is my mate, Paul, who's asking us, where does the data fit into all this? And indeed, we need to move on to looking at the sample regression line where we include data. That's why it's called a sample regression line to estimate that theoretical population regression equation. All right, well, I hope you're enjoying the video so far. I thought I'd interrupt just briefly to offer a small recommendation for a podcast called A Positive Climate, which is a podcast hosted by my very own brother, Nicholas Zeltzer and Alex McIntosh, who together, they're investigating the positive initiatives that we're making to try to correct the climate change. So they're looking at things like biofuels, like chicken poo, for example, as a means of generating energy. Uh, they're looking at electric vehicles, they're looking at V2 meats, all of those lab-grown meats and alternatives to plastic. Really interesting topics. Uh, and they interview a whole bunch of CEOs in that space, in that green renewables, um, that kind of space, which I think is a fantastic initiative. It's called A Positive Climate. They use a bunch of the statistical analysis that I look at in theory on my channel and they apply that to the real world. So quite an applicable use of the statistics you're seeing. Anyway, it's called A Positive Climate. Check it out on all the platforms that you could expect to see podcasts. Back to the video. So let's have a look now at the sample regression line. Now we can't really talk about a sample regression line without an actual sample. So let's have a look at this data set. There's 10 observations here. So we've surveyed our ice cream vendor across 10 Saturdays and we've assessed how many ice cream sales that person's made and the, let's say, maximum daily temperature of each of those Saturdays. 
Now, you'd be familiar with the scatter plot, and all we're doing there is putting our ice cream sold on the y-axis here and the daily maximum temperature on the x-axis. So a sample regression line would just be creating a line of best fit through that data. In other words, it's the best estimate that we have for the relationship between temperature and ice cream sales. It seems that the higher the temperature, the more ice creams we get sold. So indeed, there's a sort of positive relationship there. But let's backtrack now and have a look at the equation for the sample regression line. You'll notice that it's slightly different to the population regression equation, right? There are hats now on beta naught and beta one. That's one way of writing the sample regression line. The hats mean a, an estimated value of beta naught and an estimated value of beta one. And in fact, it's an estimated value of y here as well. The important factor being that there's no error term. So we're no longer worrying about an error term. This is just an expression to describe that line of best fit. That black line is being described by a gradient, that's this beta one with a hat on it, and a y-intercept, which is a beta naught with a hat on it. So there's your just y equals mx plus b, right? From high school, but just with different letters that representing m and b. Now, other textbooks will use lowercase b naught and lowercase b1 to mean the same thing. So just be careful. Some people like using betas with hats on them. Other people like using lowercase b's. But they mean the same thing. They're actualized values. These will be numbers. So I can find out what beta naught hat is. I just need to know what the y-intercept is here. I can find out what beta one hat is. I just need to find out what the gradient is of that line. And that's beta one hat. And indeed, in this case, those numbers are minus 8.82 and plus 2.86. That's beta naught hat and beta one hat. So we have here our sample regression line for this data set. Now, as I said, because it's y hat equals all this stuff, you are describing the line itself. I can create an expression which has y on the left-hand side, not y hat, and that's describing the value of y for each individual observation. And if we're gonna describe the value of y for each individual observation, we're gonna need an error term because you can see that this particular observation has an error term here. In other words, a distance from that expected line. So if we're going to describe the actual value of y, we need an error term. And you'll notice it's actually a different error term to the one we saw in the population regression equation. This one is just an E, a lowercase e, not an epsilon. So I'll get to that distinction in just a second. But for the moment, what Paul's going to ask us is, well, how did this line actually get created? How did we know that this was the line of best fit? I can just draw that line in using roughly my eyesight there. But how do we know that is the exact line that fits this data set the best? Now, your first reaction might be to say, well, let's find what all these error terms are, calculate how far these observations are from the line of best fit, and we'll try to minimize the sum of those error terms. But the problem is, you've got negative error terms here, so distances which are below the line, and you've got positive distances up here, so distances above the line. So this will give you a sum of the error terms to be zero. And I can actually create several lines that will have the sum of the error terms being zero. Here's another one. The positive error terms here are going to net out with the negative error terms. So it's not good enough just to find the sum of the error terms because that won't give us the singular line of best fit. We're going to need to minimize the sum of the squared error terms because that avoids the issue with those negative errors and turns them into positive values. So here we can find each of these error terms, we can calculate them, and then we can square them, add them together, and then minimize that final value. And the line of best fit will be the line that does indeed minimize the sum of the squared errors. That Greek letter sigma means the sum. So that's why the whole process is called ordinary least squares. You might have seen that written somewhere, ordinary least square regression. 
and of course we'd use a computer program to do that for us, but it is possible to calculate it using a calculator, which we're not going to go into in this video because it's not necessary. Now this is going to be my favorite bit of the video and in previous videos I've made on this topic, this is where the light bulbs really come on. So click your brains into gear for this. This that we just created, which was our sample regression line and notice that I've actually put in here the error term. So it's an expression of the ith value of y or just any specific value of y. So it has b0, which is our calculated y-intercept. It has b1, which is our calculated gradient. And it also has its own error term. Now, I could have used my betas with the hats on them here, but I've just chosen to use B0 and B1, remembering that some textbooks will do it this way. Now, this is actually an estimate of our population regression equation. So, lowercase b0 and lowercase b1, or beta0 hat and beta1 hat, are estimates of beta0 and beta1. So, here we found that this was indeed our sample regression line the minus 8.82 and the plus 2.86, those are estimates of beta naught and beta one. Based on the 10 data points that we collected, these are our best guesses for what beta naught and beta one are. But we can never know what beta naught and beta one actually are. So for example, if I took another sample of 10 days, say we looked at August, September and October or something, right? Here's the next 10 Saturdays worth of data. And we can create a different line of best fit that might have a completely different equation. We'll have an estimate of beta naught, which is now minus 52.4, and an estimate of beta one, which is now positive 4.08. So it's a steeper line and it has a lower y-intercept for what that's worth. Now this is still an estimate of the beta naught and beta one. But the idea is this, there is, if we sort of toggle between the two there, there's the first one, there's the second one. There is something which we're trying to estimate. Now, this sort of like yellow line here is what might be called the true relationship between daily ice cream sold and daily maximum temperature. There is something we're trying to estimate and it's that golden kind of godly line that we can never know. So we only ever get a small snapshot of data which can go into estimating that yellow line. And in the example we've got in the back, we've got that black line, which is our estimate. But the idea is that every single observation has a calculated error term to its line of best fit. And that's that lowercase e. But it also has a theoretical error term, which is that Greek letter epsilon. So that's why we have these two different error terms you'll sometimes see. Whenever you're looking at a population regression equation like this, the error term looks like that curly E, which is a Greek letter epsilon. And whenever you have an actual sample regression line, you'll have a lowercase e. And you can calculate that value for each particular observation. You cannot calculate this epsilon value because it's a theoretical one, because we can never truly know this line yellow line that I've created there, that golden line, which would represent our population regression equation. All right, let's move on to SSR, SSE, and SST. Now, if you recall, I said that the purpose of regression here is to separate the total variance in ice cream sales into variance explained by the temperature and variance that's still unexplained. We need to quantify how much is still left unexplained by the temperature. Before we look at how to calculate these things, we need to be aware of a certain peculiarity around the lettering of SSR and SSE. SST will always stand for the sum of squares total. Some people might write TSS for total sum of squares, doesn't matter. If there's a T in it, it means it's the total variance in ice cream sales. And we'll see how the sums of squares sort of fit into things in just a second. SSR, now this is the one that I use, the sum of squares due to regression. It's the variance in ice cream sales, which is explained by our regression. In other words, explained by our independent variable temperature. SSE relates to the sum of squares due to error, which is that variance in ice cream sales, 
still unexplained. Now be very careful because I've seen this in a couple of weird textbooks where TSS is the total sum of squares. ESS is the explained sum of squares, which actually relates to the variance explained by the temperature. So the R and the E have actually swapped positions, which is really annoying. E is now the explained sum of squares and R represents residual, which is another word for error. Oh, so look, don't shoot the messenger here, but uh, there are some annoying um, quirks in statistical textbooks. I'm using this middle one here where the sum of squares total is going to equal SSR, meaning the sum of squares due to regression. And SSE is everything that we don't know so far. And I think that's more common too. So what we're going to be involved in is looking at each observation and trying to figure out why it's different from the mean. So let's look at a particular observation. Here's Saturday the 1st of July. The ice cream sales on that day was high. It was 112. In fact, it was the highest one we have in our sample. Now, the question is, why is it that high? Well, that's what regression is going to help us find out. Before we incorporate the daily maximum temperature into our prediction, we're only left with the difference between that particular point, that's 112, and the mean. And we can calculate that difference. And that is going to be using the value of y, in other words, the height of the point, minus the mean value of y, which is 59. So y with a bar on it, or y bar, is the mean value of y. So that distance there represents the total deviation to the mean. Now what SST is, is the sum of all the squared distances to that mean. So if I took, you know, there's 10 observations there and you can see they've been grayed out, the other ones, but I can take this one down at the bottom and find out how close that is to the mean. It'll be a negative number, but we're gonna square it such that it becomes positive. And we're gonna add all those squared values together and we can get a calculation for SST the sum of squares total. So it's the total distance to the mean. Now what's gonna happen here is we're gonna split that total difference, total residual or error. We're gonna split that into what's explained and what's unexplained by the X variable, which is our maximum temperature. So bear with me here. Before we looked at the actual temperature as an explanatory variable, we had no idea why Saturday the 1st of July we had such high sales. But if we incorporate the fact that it was a particularly hot day, now for my North American viewers, 32 degrees centigrade or Celsius is roughly 90 degrees Fahrenheit. I had to look that up and spell Fahrenheit correctly, which I did not do. But you got to, you got to get on Celsius, Americans. I think, in fact, you know what? Let's have a look. I take a quick digression because I am very curious how many countries use Fahrenheit? Few countries, United States, Liberia, and the Cayman Islands. People, you got to get on board. <laughs> Celsius is where it's at. Nonetheless, 32 degrees Celsius is 90 degrees approximately Fahrenheit. A hot day. And we could say, well, because it was a hot day, we were actually expecting sales to be up here anyway. We were expecting sales to be at this sort of green cross point, which is, looks like about 85, something like that. And what we can do is create, therefore, a, an explained component of this variation, which is this bottom bit, and a still yet unexplained component, which is this top bit, that combines to form the total deviation from the mean. Now, what's going to happen is this bottom bit here is going to feed into SSR, which is our explained sum of squares. And this top bit is going to feed into SSE, which is our unexplained or the sum of squares due to error. So with each observation, you've got this explained deviation to the line of best fit based on what temperature it was. So colder days were expecting lower sales, warmer days were expecting higher sales, but this particular day outstripped what we expected by this much. So we're going to incorporate that 
into our calculation of error. So I've written here that this top bit adds to SSE, y minus y hat, our predicted value of y. This bit at the bottom adds to SSR because it's the predicted value of y minus the mean y bar. And you can see that the total distance to the mean, which is 59, that total distance splits nicely into SSE and SSR. So if we add all these together, it does in fact hold that SST, that's all of those distances squared and summed, will equal to SSR, all of the blue distances squared and summed, plus SSE, which is all of the red distances here squared and summed. Now, there will be some smart Alex that say that doesn't look like it necessarily holds true when you look at all of the observations. Will those sums add up together like this? Now, that's actually a very difficult mathematical question, which I'm not going to bog myself down in for this video. But if you check the description, I'll try to make a video on how that indeed works a little bit later. Um, so yeah, check the description. If I've made a video, it'll be in there. But the mathematics is beyond this video. So let's move on from there. But I hope that's given you at least a nice visual impression of what SST, R and E are about and how they link together. All right, now we're gonna look at R squared. So R squared is a very widely used calculation. And the way it's done is the SSR value over the SST. So it's the explained sum of squares divided by the total. In other words, how much of the variation in ice cream sales, what proportion of the variation in ice cream sales is being explained by daily temperature? So this is going to be very useful. It's going to be ranging between 0 and 1. And as I say here, to generalize, R squared is the proportion of the variation in the Y variable being explained by the variation in the X variables. So how much of our ice cream sales is being explained by daily temperature? That will be returned to us as R squared. So that brings us to this comparison of two particular scenarios. When, when the data set matches up really nicely with the line of best fit, you can see that the error terms, in other words, the distances to the line are very small. So SSE is going to be a really, really small value. Remember, that's the error terms, the residuals. They add to that sort of unexplained component, all those distances to that line of best fit. So if SSE is really small, and I've written that there, low SSE, we have a high R squared because the numerator is pretty much going to be the same as the denominator, SST being a combination of SSR and SSE. So again, I'll repeat that. If SSE is really small, R squared is a very, very high value, close to one, that is, because it ranges from zero to one. If the data points are further away from that line of best fit, SSE gets a bit larger, and so this fraction becomes a bit less and approaches zero or becomes less. So in this case, you might have an R squared value of 0 0.91. That says, hey, this line of best fit is really mapping out quite well to our data that we've collected. An R squared of 0 0.36 says, well, there's still some relationship there, but it's not as strong as the previous. Okay, so let's move into the final topic for this video, which is degrees of freedom and adjusted R squared. Now, this topic is not dealt with well by lecturers and sometimes textbooks alike. They don't try to give you any intuition behind the concepts. And that's what I'm going to try to rectify. So, to do so, I'm going to ask you this particular question. And I think this question really opens up that intuition I'm talking about. So ask yourself this, what is the minimum number of data points that you need to run a regression? So let's just say you have a regression with one explanatory variable, that's one X variable and a Y variable. So it could be um, our daily temperature, that's X, daily maximum temperature, trying to explain the number of sales that we have for ice cream. How many observations do you need to run a regression in the first place? Now, you might think, hey, all I need is two observations, 
because with two observations, I can draw a line of best fit and there we go, we have a regression. Well, no, that is not a regression because it doesn't matter where you put those two points. You'll always be able to draw a line immediately through both of those points. There is no possibility for error at all. Irrespective of where those points go, R squared will always be one. So you'll never actually have a regression. A regression needs the possibility for error. Here's this error term. You're never gonna get an error term if you only have two observations. And it's only with that third observation that we can run a regression because that line of best fit can now sort of escape from those observations themselves and kind of be drawn in between the observations. And that's where we say we have one degree of freedom. It's not a great regression, not at all. You'd want more observations, absolutely. And it's when you have, say, four observations that you'll get two degrees of freedom. Five observations, you'll get three degrees of freedom, etc., etc. You want more and more observations, but the key point to note is that if we go back a little bit, two observations does not make a regression. So let's move on to see what happens when we extend our regression to have an extra explanatory variable. So instead of just having daily maximum temperature, we're now going to include, say, daily rainfall to try to explain our ice cream sales as well. Now, the analogy here is no longer two-dimensional. We have X1 going to the right of the page and X2 coming out of the page. So I'm trying to draw it as a three-dimensional space. Now, instead of a line of best fit, we're talking about a plane of best fit. When we run a regression now with two X variables, the sort of geometrical analogy is no longer a line, it's a plane. So for example, if you have three points in three dimensional space, I mean, look at the room around you. Imagine you had three points in that space around you. You can draw a plane of best fit through any three points that you draw, right? Just put three kind of, imagine you've got three raindrops or whatever, just hovering around the room and you have a big piece of straight cardboard. You can put that straight cardboard through those three points, irrespective of where those points are. So with three points, you have again this situation where you've got an R squared of one. There's no error. That plane cannot escape those three points. Whereas when you have that fourth observation, Finally, you have one degree of freedom because that plane that you can construct will miss the points and it can kind of cut in between the points as opposed to touching all four points. And it's when you have five observations that you'll have two degrees of freedom, etc., etc. So what we get is this relationship between degrees of freedom, the number of observations and the number of X variables, which we use the letter K to represent. So when you add more explanatory variables, add more X variables, your degrees of freedom are actually reduced. And we saw that, right? When we had that second X variable, we needed an extra observation to maintain the same number of degrees of freedom. So the degrees of freedom sort of represents how much error can we potentially show in this model. And you want degrees of freedom. You want the model to be able to show error. So we get a sense of indeed how good that model is. So by adding more explanatory variables, the degrees of freedom are reduced. So the opportunity for error in the model is reduced. So if we kind of summarize what we saw before, when we had a model with one X variable, we needed three observations so that we'd get a degree of freedom. But when we added an extra explanatory variable here, our R squared went up to one, not because the model got any better, but because we lost the opportunity to show error. And what we're gonna find is that by adding extra variables, adding extra explanatory variables, we can fool ourselves into thinking our model's getting better, but in reality, what's happening is the model is just losing the opportunity to show any error. So let's see how this operates when we add extra explanatory variables. <clears throat> so if we return to our example, let's just say we know we have our ice cream sales over 10 observations. 
and we want to try to explain the variation in ice cream sales. So the first thing we do is we incorporate the daily temperature as our first explanatory variable and we find that the degrees of freedom that we have here is actually 8 because we have 10 observations, that's n equals 10. We have one explanatory variable and so n minus 1 minus 1 gives us 8 degrees of freedom and our r squared when we run this model is 0.58. So that tells us that 58% of the variation in ice cream sales is being explained by temperature. Awesome. That's not so high, but it tells us we have a bit of information. Now, when we incorporate a second explanatory variable, that's rainfall, notice the degrees of freedom actually goes down to 7 because we now have n minus k minus 1, 10 minus 2 minus 1 because k is equal to 2 now. We have two explanatory variables. Our R squared has increased to 0.74, so we're thinking this is great. R squared's going up, we're explaining a larger proportion of ice cream sales now. 74% of the variation in ice cream sales is being explained by our model. Looking good. So, we're going to add another variable, which is school holidays. And you'll notice that school holidays happen in July here in Australia. So, this is actually, this is actually called a dummy variable. We're not going to get too much into that, but... Let's just incorporate that information to say that we now have three X variables. Degrees of freedom is six and our R squared's going up again. So we're really patting ourselves on the back here going, this is awesome. Our model is getting better and better explaining ice cream sales. Then what happens is we incorporate what is clearly a nonsensical variable. I've put in here the moon phase, right? That will have no impact on ice cream sales. We've increased the value of K because we now have a new variable to put into our model. Our degrees of freedom is going down again and our R squared, it still went up. So if we were to summarize this information with our four models that we had, progressively adding more and more X variables, you can see that the R squared continued to increase. And here's the thing about R squared. R squared will only ever increase when you throw more variables in the model. So by throwing more variables in the model, irrespective of how useless they are, the R squared will still increase. And we might be thinking to ourselves, hey, this is still good. R squared went up a little bit. Moon phase is clearly relevant. Let's keep that model with including moon phase. But look at the adjusted R squared. The adjusted R squared actually goes down. Now, this is the formula that is used to adjust for the fact that you're losing degrees of freedom. So, remember what I said before, that we can get fooled into thinking that our model's getting better, but what's really happening is that our model is losing the ability to show error or to find error. And the adjusted R squared reflects that. You can see that when we included moon phase, our adjusted R squared actually went down. So that maybe gives us some information that the best model we had here included temperature, rain and holidays, but did not include moon phase. So even though R squared has this really nice interpretation where we can say, all right, 84% of the variation in ice cream sales is being explained by the variation in temperature, rain and holidays, we do have a bit of a problem with R squared when you have a small number of observations. Because when you have a small number of observations, you have a low number of degrees of freedom. And in that case, we might need to look at an adjusted R squared value, which takes that into account. You don't really have a nice interpretation of adjusted R squared, but in, at least we can use this for comparison across models. All right, so that brings us to the end of the video. I hope you've really enjoyed it. And if you have, feel free to like the video and subscribe to the channel. Uh, if you do subscribe, you'll be privy to what's happening on the channel over the next little bit. I know I've been a bit lazy with posting content recently. I've been busy becoming a school teacher over the last few years, so cut me some slack. But I am gonna be doing some interesting content on how high school mathematics applies to the real world. It's going to be called Mountain Maths. So stick around for the channel. Well, 
subscribe to the channel so you can see that coming down the pipeline. Anyway, my name's Justin, zstatistics.com is the website, and I will catch you at the next video. Catch you around.